Welcome to the Sad Boys Book Club. My name is Dusty. And I'm Daniel. Welcome to the final part of Mr. Mercedes by Stephen King. Wow. This one really, really went by very fast. Yeah. Um, I think I only had, like, maybe four reading sessions for this one. Really? Yeah. I, I Man, it... it, it you, you stick to it, man. I, I just kept... It, it's a real page-turner. I just didn't want to stop reading when I was reading it. I... I yeah. That, that was my experience as well. I... I really liked this book. It was... I, I don't know that I would put it in the top tier of King, but this is, like, very, very good. Like, easy to read. Easy to just pick up and just... Just devour kind of Stephen King. And, um... I don't know. I, I think it is perfect that we did it this time of year. It really captures the spirit of like the the summer summer vacation slash summer beach read kind of book. Yeah. Um, yeah, it, it did feel quite appropriate given the the time of year we're at. Um, man, I had I had so much fun reading this. Yeah, it's. I don't. I don't. I. I really feel like I need to really dig down, and because I, 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 we read all these books, but sometimes, um, sometimes we we do a little bit more analysis than other times. This is one. I I almost would want to read again sometime just to really kind of like. Look at the style and kind of see. What what is it that King's doing? And maybe we'll come to this some conclusions uh, by the end here. But what is King doing here that makes it so like engaging, so hooky? You know, that keeps you wanting to to just keep going. Yeah, I don't know. He's got a very um, I don't know. It's I think it's something to do with his writing style. Um, the way that he. Uh, I don't know, his prose is very, um, I don't want to say hypnotic, but, uh, it just, he really knows exactly what to say and how to say it in a way that will draw you in and keep you in. Yes, definitely. And it's, it's different than, say, um... It was a good example of that of, of, of books that we've read. It's it's a little different than like James Baldwin and Giovanni's room, where there like the there's like an almost internal like propulsive rhythm to it that you just read and it just like your eyes carried across the page almost. It's it's a little different than that. It's it just there's something about it though that just you just read it and you're just ready you're ready for more. I don't know. It's it's pretty it's pretty neat. Yeah. So, having uh, gone through this now, I asked you this in the first episode, and it might have been really early then, but it might be a little more appropriate now. How does this sit in your um, in your Stephen King tier list? Hmm. Um. Well, if I had to had to put it there, put it somewhere. I would say like a solid a solid B, um, and I realize that sounds bad, but like when you take into account like his, and I'm taking into account all all works that I've read of his, including um, short stories. I think you know it's it's a good story, good premise. There's a there are a few things that are not great, <laughs> um, like the the whole uh, Jerome. And his Tyrone persona, um, that's that's not so good. But and and it doesn't really it doesn't really serve much of a narrative purpose either, um, or really inform that much about the character um, because it doesn't really. I mean, it kind of gives you a detail about the character about his discomfort, but. Uh, it doesn't really inform any of his actions, choices, or really anything super relevant, at least heretofore. Um, so, 
that kind of knocks it down a little bit, but the, like the the minute to minute plot unfolding is really interesting. It's really fun, um, and I think I think it's some good. It's it's a good depiction of that sort of time and place of that sort of uh, you know first Obama tenure era America. Yeah, um, and I, I do think. Um... I, first off, I very much do agree with your uh, assessment of, of it being in the in the B range. Um, I think how I described it to you um, was it's either his worst great book or his best good book, at least that I've read from from the ones that I've read. Um, and I, you know, the the fact that you feel like you had to qualify, like oh, it's a B, but that's not a bad thing. I think kind of speaks to. A lot of the um, kind of all or nothing mentality with media nowadays, to where this book was quite good. It was very enjoyable. Uh, I had such a fun time reading it. I really don't have too many bad things to say about it. Like I mean, it, you know, it's it's not a perfect book. There are missteps, like you said. The Tyrone uh, persona that that um, Jerome takes up is probably uh, probably not the best. Uh, it's very heavy handed and uh, probably could have been done a lot better, but. It's it's kind of one of those things to where this book uh, it's it's better than the sum of its parts, I'd say, but you know that doesn't mean it's a masterpiece either. It's it was just a very good book that I enjoyed reading that I might maybe read again in the future if if it tickles my fancy and it's just another example of of King's remarkable talent and uh, longevity in the in the arts. I will say this it, I I am. I am curious about it. It's maybe curious enough that I would be interested in in uh, reading other um, reading some of the other books in the Bill Hodges trilogy. Yeah, the next one is uh, Finders Keepers, and the third one is End of Watch. If anyone is interested, which I'm very curious how those will go, uh, given that this book was uh, i mean they came out in i'm pretty sure they were in subsequent years i think this one was 2014 and then the next one's 2015 next one's 2016 um so in quick enough succession that maybe this book may not have been originally planned as a series probably during production and maybe even before the the final draft um, this had been moved into a series i would i would imagine yeah, and I'm wondering if the Bill Hodges trilogy is very, um, if it'll end up being very episodic, because in my opinion, this told a complete story that did not do any sequel baiting. Uh, even even with how the the ending kind of goes, I don't really feel like it was one of those last second cliffhanger. Ooh, I wonder what'll happen in the next one. Kind of, it just it really did feel quite self contained. So um, yeah, I'm wondering if the if the other two books go that way as well, or if the second and third one are kind of a combined story. I, I guess a good example of this, um, I'd say for modern pop culture, uh, but I'm, I'm talking. I'm going to re- reference something that the, a trilogy that is older than the Bill Hodges trilogy, kind of something like Pirates of the Caribbean, where the first one was a very self-contained story, but then two and three are sequels to one, but they tell their own personal story that's separate from one, but still combines into a trilogy i could see something like that yeah which that's weird to think about how old pirates of the caribbean is now by the way just oof (laughs) yeah wasn't wasn't the last one or the last of the original trilogy like 2006 or something like that i want to say it was 2007 oh well i just remember there this is this image of the um i can't remember his name this the the squid captain Davy, Davy Jones, Jones, maybe, yeah. Yeah, you know, um, only one of the most famous pirates in in mythological lore. Well, but that's not what it. Anyway, <laughs> he he wasn't a squid man. No, um, but but the uh, but the squid this that, that that depiction of him goes around a lot with like um, captions on like various social media platforms. This was two thousand and six era CGI. What happened? Um, Implying that in in many cases, correctly, I would say, um, CGI was better, uh, or at least that was better than a lot of what we get today. I mean, um, if you want an even bigger example that's even older than that, look at the T-Rex in, in Jurassic Park, which was 30 years ago. 
and compare it to, you know, something like... And granted, there is a story as to why it was this bad, but compare it to something like the climax of Black Panther, which was, like, you know, notoriously awful. I remember watching the... Watching it in theaters with you, we both went to see it. We saw it together, you and I. Watching Black Panther in theaters, and then the end where you have the Phantom Menace final fight between uh, the two characters, and the CG was so bad, and we were just like, "What? What happened here?" Because it was really solid throughout the entire movie, and then all of a sudden, we get to the climax, and it just, but, <laughs> which yeah, like I said, there was a reason for it. There, you know, it was apparently. Um, uh, I don't remember if it was they fired the original CGI team or if they had or if or I, I don't that that particular detail I don't remember but basically the crew that was doing the CGI was given less than a month to work on it and that was like they were working on it up to like the premiere of the movie if I remember correctly so yeah, um, that's that's where I was actually gonna go is like yeah it's working conditions uh, particularly in CG and in films is just gotten so incredibly bad that it's like you know that yeah. that's why it's because they you know and there's a lot of like it's back and forth um some directors i believe the russos for example or no it wasn't the russos it was one of the superhero people um they have they they're they're pretty infamous for going back and forth um with with their cg teams or their animation teams and and it causes um pretty significant delays and and having to redo things and scrap a lot of good work it's anyway yeah so that the, I, I i i guess i've forgotten how we've we've gotten here but uh, uh pirates there's... of the caribbean was how we got here yeah yeah which i want to just really quickly say more often than not it is not the fault of the animators it is the fault of the studio putting unrealistic expectations and time frames on the talented animators so black panther was not the animator's fault it was marvel's fault Correct. But you had a lot more. The culture was probably even more crunchy because uh, you were probably having to crunch a lot more back in 2006. But you probably had a lot more time to be forced to crunch as it was. That I'm less aware of. It just it feels it feels like a lot of what I've read um, seems to imply that in the modern era that there's a lot more like. A lot more issues, but then again, I've not done any, any, a too deep dive into like the history of the of the profession, just conditions in the current day. So yeah. I imagine I can't really speak to that. I imagine the difference is a lot of crunch within a period of a month compared to a lot of crunch within the period of like a year. Yeah, that that well could be. Yeah, and how does this relate to Mister Mercedes? You might be asking, intrepid listener. Um, it doesn't. That's just our infamous tangent on display. Mr. Mercedes. <laughs> what a fun book. Um, Very so, good. Oh, go ahead. Uh, so, uh, to just, I guess, just to jump into it. Uh, so, this last part that we cover here, um, I want to call it part five, uh, even though it's, I guess it's technically part six, because I, 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 the gray Mercedes, I, I consider the prologue, and then debt red, I consider part one, when I've been talking about this. This is uh, Kisses on the Midway, which I'm calling Part 5. And while I would technically... Say, I'm, I'm going to say this is the last part, because this book isn't numbered. I'm numbering these myself, myself here. Um, we have, like, three epilogues here. There's, like, the Proclamation... Or maybe it's only two. Uh, there's, like, the Proclamation and then, like, Blue Mercedes, I think, are the two epilogues. That's what I'm going to call them. And the Proclamation is one page. It's just a letter from the mayor. So, whatever. But all that to say, Part 5... Uh, Kisses on the Midway, the final major part of the book. Whole thing takes place in one day. And it feels like it when you're reading it. Oh, yeah. You, you know what it kind of reminded me of? And um, it's kind of... It's it's not it's not lost on me why I think I was reminded of this, because Holly does directly reference it. Uh, add this to the list of Stephen King pop culture references. It reminds me of a lot of watching 24. I don't know if you ever watched that back in the day. I was aware of it, but did not watch. Um, I only ever made it about halfway through season two before I fell off. Not because I lost interest, I just lost time. And I just never went back to it. But I really, really enjoyed that show for what I watched. Season one was very good. Um, I'm sure you're aware of the the, the general conceit that the show uh, tries to sell the audience. It's all shown in real time. Uh, every hour, 
of one day is shown and at you know when you go to commercial break and you come back that time is taken into account and so you're you're watching ostensibly a full hour of the day and in most of the seasons i think all of the original run i think there are 24 episodes in a season they may, that may not be true for the final couple of seasons but generally speaking there were 24 episodes in a season and each episode was one hour out of that day and how the episodes were titled was season one was day one season two was day two season three was day three etc and it would be like day one 7 a.m to 8 a.m day one 8 a.m to 9 a.m that was like how the episodes were titled um, this reminds me a lot of that, of how, how the it's it feels like it's contained in one day, but it's very frenetic and it's very well paced to where it just feels like a very action packed, exciting day without feeling like it was too long to be a day. Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. Cool. Um. Yeah. Uh. This this uh, this Thursday that this book takes place in is going to be the day of the Round Here concert at the Mac Arena, uh, the Mac Which Artist is Auditorium. Which perfect, perfect name for an artist from that time. Yeah, right? <laughs> uh, which, uh, I don't remember if we talked about this in the last one. It's, uh, it's the boy band concert, and I think we talked about how he's planning on blowing it up. Uh, it's the boy band concert... Uh, which I find just crazy. Well, maybe it's not that crazy that there was a boy band in 2010. When did One Direction... Yeah, they had... Uh, yeah, exactly. That's what I was going to say. I, I don't remember when One Direction were super big. I know it was 10 years ago, but I don't know like how how long ago it was. I, that was very much for me just a, something that came and went, and I only had a, a cursory awareness of it because it was just not for me. But, it was uh, around that time period, yeah. Yeah, so... Uh, this is the day of that concert. Uh, the stage has kind of been set. Brady uh, is on the run, kind of. Not, like, super on the run, but just on the run in the way that he's hiding out just in case. Uh, because he thinks that, that Bill... Or he's not sure if Bill was bluffing when Bill implied that he, on uh, the Under Debbie's Blue Umbrella, that he, was, he had more information than he let on and he was... He basically put the fear of God in him to make him think that oh I'm 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 about to, I'm about to get you, so he's he's now in hiding for this day uh, until he can go to the concert that night and do his his big uh, final act of terrorism, and uh, meanwhile Bill is still in a state of it, very conflicting feelings. He's still having like a state of grieving for for Janie's death, but he also has. Uh, one, a, a, a lust for revenge, if you'll allow me that, uh, and a need to see this through. But he understands that he um, he's basically done all he feasibly can, or at least he thinks so at this point. So what he kind of gives up is, if he doesn't catch Mr. Mercedes today, he's going to give everything to Pete Huntley tonight, Okay, turn it over to the police, and deal with the consequences that may come his way. Um, so that's where where he's at. And uh, if we also remember to kind of add some personal stakes to the Round Here concert, Jerome's little sister uh, and three of her friends are being taken to that concert by Jerome's mom. So we have a personal stake in the uh, fate of the concert because we know people that are going to be there as opposed to just the 4,000 uh, people, unnamed, faceless people that will be there. So that's where we're at starting this section. Yeah, and um, what what it's I, I I read all of this pretty early on in the week, so I forget where where exactly did we leave off? Did we leave off when uh, when they went to go um, to to investigate his place of work? Uh, no, so the the first thing that, that the, the way that this part starts is, uh, yeah. so yeah, he has, uh, so yeah, Jerome calls him and he's like, hey, I can give you a ride to wherever you're going to need to be because, you know, your car's, your car's been blown up. Uh, and Bill has a plan to, he wants to contact the, um, what was the guy's name, Radney, uh, Radney Mullins or something like that. Uh, might have just confused that with Rodney Mullen. Uh, <laughs> uh <laughs> 
uh, Rodney Rad- Peoples is the guy he he said he said his name sounds like. So it's that's a, right. I think it's Rodney. Maybe it's Rodney Mullins. It might have been Rodney Peoples. That might have been his actual name. I thought that was the name of the guy. He said, "Oh, is your name like what?" Oh well, it, it doesn't matter. It's, 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 it's just Rodney. Rodney, the security from the beginning. Yeah. So he has Jerome uh, call the security and uh, like kind of you know deepen his voice and act like he is uh, part of some. Uh, law Institute that's working with Janie's lawyer, uh, George Schron is his name, and that uh, they, he wants to get into contact with Radney because he had heard from uh, he had heard from uh, Mrs. Wilcox, who uh, Bill remembers is the woman that Radney mentioned, that he thinks um, uh, they might have been, you know, having a very close relationship, which he uses that as a way that, oh, that'll be that, that'll ensure that Radney calls him back. Uh, basically, calling to basically get Radney called to call them back. So then, event, and then they just wait until he does, and when he does, um, Jerome talks to him, and uh, I think it's from there because uh, he's wanted to try and figure out. Uh, he's wanted to ask Radney about uh, who. Uh, if if the people there if they get their IT, who their IT guy is he wants to figure out who Olivia Trelawney's IT guy was and he learns uh, from Radney Jerome does that it's the green Volkswagens with the Cyber Patrol logo on it so they go in and they they look up Cyber Patrol and they find the the discount electronics and they see the meet our team because of course there very conveniently happens to be a meet our crew meet meet, meet your your trained experts and it's a picture of all of the three of them it's the 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 oh god what's his name what do they call him tones anthony um something frobisher frobisher who is like the manager i don't know if we've really mentioned him much but he's not really important um uh freddie link 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 light later link later and then link ladder i think yeah and then um brady so uh they know that one of those three is mr mercedes uh and so they're gonna go their plan now is to go to de and see what they can find when they get there they see holly there uh she figured it out as well and she was just like oh my god i can't you're finally here if, was, if you would have taken another half hour i would have called you and told you myself because she went and was still looking back through olivia's computer and even though brady had deleted everything that might have pointed to him what he didn't think to delete was her spam uh her spam folder and her email and in there was a bunch of uh, coupons and uh, um, advertisements from DE, and you know, including a oh here this much off on your next IT. So she figured it out through there. So she, and she'd been waiting for them, and so uh, Bill is going to go in and try to ostensibly, hopefully, catch Mr. Mercedes based on the initial reaction of of him seeing Bill, because he knows that there's no way that he's going to be able to hide his reaction the initial reaction when he sees it. Which, this is an interesting portion. Um, I think it's really kind of kind of neat that they show like two the two different ways to uh, resolve this. And also, it kind of demystifies, um, and I wonder if this was done on purpose, the idea of the, of the, the, the lone wolf uh, a killer. Because it's, you know, he, he very clearly did not... Re- he thought he was covering his tracks, but in many ways, he really didn't. Yeah, um, and all it takes is because, one one slip up. Uh, other other little thing before we move on here, I think it's it's interesting that they um, he he says that Holly resembled like a like a teenager, um, like the way with, with something about her pose. I remember um, her knees together, her legs her like feet apart. Yeah, and then she was like hunched over an iPad, which was uh, <laughs> that's kind of amusing. Um, I don't know if they had iPads in 2010, but I don't know. They absolutely did. Oh well, we didn't have iPad money, so <laughs> not many people did, of course. But um, I just don't. I just don't remember. But anyway, so well, hey, hey, she, man, Holly gets an allowance, you know. Oh yes, that. So uh, anyway, that th- well, thank you for that because that takes me back to the point. Is like, it's interesting that they show this in her like, um, 
it really goes to cement the sort of characterization of her as like being an arrested development sort of adolescent um early middle-aged woman <laughs> yeah um so anyways um he goes in to confront which we know that brady is not there because brady is currently holed up in a hotel but um while he's in there jerome notices that uh holly drove the mercedes there and he's just kind of speechless about it meanwhile holly seems completely oblivious to it which i just find very funny given how like neurotic she's been especially around points of like trauma Mm -hmm. so for her to just be so just kind of blase about the mercedes and seemingly ignorant about it which i feel like there's no way she wouldn't have known right surely uh i think i think it may not be entirely like unintentional maybe it was written as a joke which i mean i'm not saying that's a bad thing it might it was kind of amusing um but i think maybe it's also kind of shows her blind spots you know we're talking about brady's blind spots when he's committing this crime she kind of is like she doesn't view it as like oh this is the murder weapon this is the the thing that you know ruined you know killed all those people and ruined my cousin's life it's to her it's just the car you know yeah but uh yeah and then he also has another realization as well because she's sitting there and I feel like this kind of paints uh, uh, an even broader picture of the whole teenage comparison to her. Because she's just like, hey, um, if this doesn't pan out or whatever, can we go get some like frozen yogurt or something? I really want some ice cream. I was it. hoping you were going to say that. Dude, okay, sorry. This is going to be a, this is gonna be another tangent. You can edit me if you have to. But what happened to frozen yogurt places? There's one just down They're the gone. street from me. There's one next to my half price books. Okay, well, where I live in in uh, in texas they are all gone it's that's just, very it's unfortunate like, it's like with it's like they they were they were one of the COVID casualties i think i mean they were like but there's they were very much of that time though i i, I remember people going all the time um high schoolers going um, people, I remember when I was in college, a little, you know, a few years after this, you know, people going to go get frozen yogurt, but it's just like, I don't know what that like. We we as a culture decided we did we, we were out on frozen yogurt. Um, That's a shame. They're just they're just gone now. Yeah, it must be a your area kind of thing. I don't know how many there are in my area, but I know there's one next to the half price for me. Yeah, it's just like. And, and, it, and it's not even just specifically where I live. It's like the whole metro area. They're just gone. Hmm. Well, pour one out for, uh, for Froyo. I guess, I guess it's, I don't, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, I could culture war casualty or COVID casualty. You decide. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that causes Jerome to also have the realization that uh, and he, he realizes where he uh, he recognized the picture of Brady from from the uh, the DE website. It's the ice cream man that has been coming around their area a lot this last summer and spring. Uh, Noticeably frequently, he points he points out he's like he's been here like a lot. Yeah. Meanwhile, inside, Bill goes up. He sees uh, he sees tones uh, tone. He gives him just the the kind of I'll, I'll be with you in a minute kind of look that that managers uh when dealing with customers will give people and it's like okay it's not him he goes up to freddie she gives him just such a, a such a nonchalant just kind of like oh it's, okay there's someone there so he realizes it's not both of them so that just leaves brady he tries to get brady's address from them and freddie's able to give it to him real quick uh in the meantime jerome's trying to call him but he just ignores it uh, but he gets Brady's address, so that's where his next uh, his next plan is. Meanwhile, also it might be worth mentioning he, um, like a uh, probably let's this is probably a bad cop thing to do. He kept all of his old uh, licenses when they expired and put them in his safe. Uh, not really sure why you would do that unless you you know. Well, I guess there may be some sentimental attachment to them, but he probably he's probably got a lot of them as well since he was a cop for 40 years. But those old ones don't have the retired stamp on them. 
So he's able to use his uh, his previous one that expired in 2008. He just is doing that bar that classic, conveniently covering the information he doesn't want someone to see with his thumb when he shows his uh, his badge, uh, his ID to, to somebody. So that's what he's been doing this whole time. So he leaves, and Jerome uh, basically tackles him and tells him, it's the ice cream dude, it's it, it's him, and he's the same guy, this, he's ice cream being here. And Bill makes the connection, and he realizes that he was told without really being told this when he was interviewing that that kind of crazy woman in Sugar Heights. I don't remember. Uh, I don't think we did. But... We, we might have just barely mentioned it, if anything. And he, he, you know, he's kind of like hitting himself uh, over like not 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 catching that. And you know, we as the reader, when she says the ice cream man, we're like, there it is, there's the there it is, right there. And there are a couple of times where he'll be he'll he'll feel something in the back of his mind that's just like like a little a little like tickle that's some important piece of information that he's just not quite putting the pieces together for. And but that but it's just gone just as quick as it came. And he's like, well, if it's really important, it will eventually. I'll eventually figure it out, and I think that's what that was. The was the ice cream man, uh, but now it's all there, laid out. Unfortunately, in terms of what he can do at this point in time, it is too little, too late, because Brady, at this point, uh, he's fled his he's house. The yeah, he's staying at a motel. Um, he's purchased a wheelchair. He has um, set up. The wheelchair and this this really loose clothing, including a big extra large round here T-shirt. Uh, he's like sewn up the the pockets of the, the the pants, the baggy pants. Put the explosives in them. Uh, put the explosives in the side pockets of the wheelchair, under the wheelchair. Got it all rigged up to go. And to make sure he is uh, as much inconspicuous as he can be, just in case Bill does indeed know his identity. Um, he has shaved his head and has bought some some glasses, some like fake glasses to to wear, uh, to make himself look as different as he can. So Brady is, um, I mean, he's going all in on it. That's uh, that's for sure. Yeah, this this part of the book is is very chilling. Um, just the whole the whole sections of, with Brady. This is this is when Stephen King is really leaning into. Um, I would say some of his like horror, um, his horror horror bona fides to kind of create. Not that this approaches horror, but it does create like a very dark and and sadistic kind of thriller kind of territory. Yeah, like what it's like to be in the mind of a monster who knows that he's about to go out in a blaze of glory. Yeah, and and, and is excited about it. He did a really good job with with uh, characterizing Brady. I think. Brady and his characterization is one of is maybe the strongest singular aspect of the novel. I would say. Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I would say that there were. I like basically every character more than him, but he was definitely the strongest, most well realized character. Yeah, he's he's very much the villain. There's never any ambiguity of how villainous and how despicable he is. And King makes it very very clear very present and does not does not mind reminding you at every single occurrence just how awful despicable evil brady is so yeah so that's what brady's doing and there's honestly outside of some sort of uh divine intervention i don't think there's any way that bill could have taken all of these final revelations and used them to get brady at this point in time because he has his identity but we know he's planning on killing himself that night uh so it's kind of a an now or never thing but uh brady decides he wants to send bill one last message on the umbrella and it was um it was something along the lines of uh uh like uh see you later asshole um I have I don't have my book in front of me, so I'm not, I'm not going to flip through the try and read it real quick. But it's along the lines of like, see you later, asshole. Um, uh, I'm I'm going to have a great weekend. That was pretty much it. Almost probably almost exactly. Yeah, it's like two lines. Uh, so uh, they he, they haven't seen it yet. 
uh, I don't think they see it until, yeah, until he gets back to his apartment or his house rather. Um, so their their first thing is to head to uh, to Brady's house, uh, and Bill sees the Mercedes and he thinks he sees a ghost. And Jerome's like, I know, I thought the same thing too, but uh, they decide to take the Mercedes, and Holly forces herself to come along because uh, she's a part of this now too, and he wants to kind of take them both out of the equation but they they refuse and uh you know she says the uh you don't you you are not enough to figure this out to solve this but we are uh which uh this final part has done such a great job uh this whole final part uh at making holly such an endearing and great character like she felt pretty just kind of backgroundy up to this point but this is the this is the part that really just kind of uh cements her uh, as the main character and we get our final trio so to say of Bill, Jerome and Holly uh, they are the the Bill Hodges task force that is going to take down Mr. Mercedes and I'm all about it and I will say that I one, I see how I, n- I now understand how she would later go on to lead two al- albums two, two books uh, of her own um I'm after after this section I'm like okay now that makes sense um, and also it's just it's really strong writing on the part of Stephen King to show how he took this background character that in most in I I could see a draft or a version of the story where she like disappears entirely after the uh, after the the attack at the funeral but instead he like really leans in and he foregrounds her in a very interesting way um that is kind of ve- but is also very respectful of of uh of her her limitations and like all of her you know all of the things that make her her and like all the anxiety and all of those things but writes it in a very positive way i don't know it's just it's just very good writing here that i if brady's number one Holly is number two, I would say, and it's not really close. Yeah. In terms of favorite characters, I think Jerome is going to stay number one for me because he's just such a consistently great character from start to finish. But I think Holly yeah. very quickly crept up to be number two for me because of this final part. Yeah, hard agree. Yeah. Uh, so they go to Brady's house. There's a very nosy neighbor who's being a nosy neighbor. Uh, and obviously, uh, Bill's not able to get in. Uh, the front door, it's locked. There doesn't seem to be anybody there. He goes around the back, doesn't seem to be anybody there. But uh, the good news is, when he left his house that morning, he got he brought his father's gun with him, uh, his little sock with the, the metal things in it. The what, What's he call it? The, 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 the happy the, slapper. The happy slapper. The thing that he used to beat up those uh, the, the punks that were harassing the kid under the bridge in the, the first section we covered. Uh, and he also brings this black uh, kind of billfold kind of looking leather thing which uh we learn is a lockpick set it's his dad's lockpicks so he breaks in the back door uh scopes the house out finds brady's mom dead in her bed uh he's he chalks it up to it could be that brady poisoned her it could be that the booze got her and she went out quote unquote the rock star way so the three of them get inside and they're looking around. Uh, they go down to the basement, turn the lights on. Uh, Jerome tries to turn on one of the computers, and the countdown starts. And Holly, realizing what it is, freaks out and turns the computer off before uh, anything can happen. Uh, so thankfully, the the wipe didn't does not occur. But they realize that they don't have enough information to uh, kind of continue at this point in time. So they can see that they're going to go back. Uh, Bill at I'm this ast- point I'm astonished by the way that, that the uh, shut they were able to avoid the wipe by just turning them off yeah that, that did kind of surprise me I figured Brady would have been a little more like like maybe had also some sort of kill switch to where if they would have unplugged it then that would have uh, that would have also caused it but I guess he just didn't have the forethought to do so because all it would have taken is someone knowing what that meant and then being like, oh, and then just turning them off, and then suddenly it's, okay, now we can just figure out what the deal is with this, and then we can come back to it later. So, yeah. another another piece of sloppiness on, on Brady's part. 
But, um, yeah, so Bill, he thinks that he's just kind of, I think he, he thinks that he's hit a dead end. So he's going to just call Pete Huntley and turn everything over to him and do his best to make sure that Holly and Jerome are not um, taking the fall with him. Uh, however, something that kind of happened in the background for, like, one little mini chapter uh, was there were two beat officers uh, just kind of chilling uh, next to that bridge where the happy slapper uh, got some happy slaps in. And they see a guy leaving this, um, uh, what, what, it was like a, oh, it was a pawn shop. Yeah. And he's holding like this big, long flower box and, uh, they're just kind of watching him cause like, that's kind of weird. And he's slipping as he's getting to his van and it reveals that there is a, um, he, the, 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 one of the cops thinks it's a, um, an RPG. So they, they just, like, zoom up and try to bust this dude. Meanwhile, the entire ATF just kind of falls down on top of them as well. Basically, just kind of a, yeah, you know, you just kind of blew our cover. And they go in and they bust the entire um, the entire pawn shop. So that's something that kind of happened in the background during this. So when, uh, when Bill calls Pete to tell him everything, Pete is celebrating with the rest of the, um, uh, the uh, department. Because um, those two cops that busted them are now uh, allowing the department to force themselves to be a part of this massive bust. Uh, they found a huge amount of weapons, explosives, ammo, and it turns out uh, the owner of the pawn shop is related to the crime family that Bill just so happened to say was probably responsible for the car bomb. So Pete Huntley... Like just such a weird, crazy coincidence. Uh, Pete Huntley's like, "You were right, Bill. It was them. They did it. Ah, oh, we got nothing to worry about now, huh? You lucky old dog." And uh, Bill is not able to to tell him, so that just kind of gives him a little bit of a second wind on what to do with uh, Mr. Mercedes. But there's nothing really to do now at this point, so the plan is just to go back to his house and see what they can do. Holly, in the meantime, wants to take uh, Brady's mom's laptop with them because maybe there's something in there that might give them the answers to the basement. Maybe she uh, was paying a little more attention to Brady than they would have thought given that they figure out how much of a drunk that she was. So they take all of that back to his place and it's... Uh, I think it's there, back at his place, that uh, Jerome sees the uh, the message from the Blue Umbrella. That final message that I'm going to have a great weekend. Uh, and so they kind of split off into two teams. Uh, Jerome is going to be looking into any major events that might be happening in the area this, this weekend, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Uh, and Holly is going to try to crack the computer, which we get... Uh, some very fun uh, outbursts from Holly during this section. <laughs> While she's just in the background, we just hear her shouting in dismay every time she does not figure out the password, which is quite funny. Yeah, this is a big moment for her, like, of like her. I don't want to say coming out of her shell per se, but it does. You do see some more of her personality beyond the surface level. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, that's kind of going on for a while. Bill's trying to kind of... I, I don't want to say find his zen place, but it's just something kind of equivalent, him just going through everything in his head, trying to um, put the pieces together that um, he's missing and try to figure this out. But, uh, yeah, a lot, a lot is just kind of still a mystery at this point. But, uh, yeah, eventually uh, he has to... He feels like he has to call it. Um, Jerome finds a, um, an event happening on, I think, Saturday that is uh, ostensibly another job fair, and they both agree that it fits the MO for Mr. Mercedes pretty perfectly, so that's probably what it is. And he's like, okay, I gotta call Pete, and I gotta tell him everything. I'm gonna give him the uh, information about the job fair thing, and that, that, that's it. It's a wash. And uh, Holly's trying to, you know, begging to have him uh, allow him her to continue uh, and he's, you know, basically just enough time for him to go and get her some more cigarettes and then he gets back. That's going to be it. Uh, so they go, they come back and she's still not really any further 
but uh, she's, you know, looking through. She had also taken, she filched the wallet as well that we learned, uh, but mostly she's like, I don't need to, I think this is when the whole allowance thing happens. So I, I have an allowance, it's fine, because she's like, I'm not trying to steal any money from her, I'm just trying to see if there's any clues in her wallet. And she's like getting super defensive, which is, it's really funny, because it, she's, I, I believe her, I think that that actually is what it is. She's just trying to find every clue that she can. Uh, there's no malicious intent behind her taking the wallet, but I just think it's really funny how defensive she gets about it. Yeah. It's almost childlike. Um, but uh, he's looking at, uh, he looks at a couple of the pictures in her wallet, and on the back of them, uh, it's, it's a picture of her and Brady. Uh, it has Honey Boy written on it, which is her nickname for Brady that she calls him. And he says, hey, try this. And that ends up being her password. So, woo! They get into her computer. Uh, they search through her com her computer, eventually finding um, a folder called Honey Boy, and in there there is a document that's called Basement, and it has um, uh, the she she heard his commands. It was um, was chaos, it? darkness. Yeah, that was for the computer. The lights were was it just lights? I thought that that was chaos, but was it control? That, no, I think it was control, maybe, because he he was doing the shadow of the hedgehog kind of deal. Yeah, because chaos was turning the computers on and darkness was stopping the kill, the the kill code. Um, so they see those, and so they 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 now have the information. Um, but there's also a note where she says that she tried doing it herself, but um, for some reason it doesn't recognize her voice when she does it. So Holly infers from that that they have to um, they have to match Brady's uh, his voice his voice kind of pitch and and tone. So they go back to the house. Uh, the nosy neighbor is out again, being a nosy neighbor still. Uh, and Holly's asking him what Brady talk like how he sounds, and he's just like, I don't know, normal. And she keeps asking him more questions. She's like, I told you, he sounds normal, I don't know. <laughs> Which is a funny interaction. Uh, so, yeah, she, um, she says it has to be, it has to be, um, Jerome to do it, because, uh, she's a woman, and Bill is too old, so Jerome has to try to mimic his, his manner of speaking. And they go down to the basement, He's able to do it. They cut it pretty close. They only have like five seconds left because he gets kind of nervous as it's happening. But it's a success. They get into the... They stop the kill code. And now they're going to... Um, Holly's going to start at computer one. Jerome's going to start at computer seven. And they're going to just work their way to the middle to try and figure out what they can with the computers. Because they also think that not all of them might be exactly uh, important. Meanwhile, Bill sits down and just kind of waits... And uh, starts feeling some pain in his shoulder that uh, may or may not be important. So yeah, Bill, uh, he sees something at his feet and he picks it up. It's a ball bearing. He finds under the stairs a trash bag that has the suicide vest and some ball bearings in it. So he realizes um, he had taken the explosives, but to do what, he's not sure. Um, but he sees what the vest was supposed to be. Uh, meanwhile, uh, <laughs> Holly finds very uh uncomfortable pictures of brady's mom that it looks like she's posing for and that's you know just uh another another layer of, of sick to that <laughs> yeah it's um it's very unfortunate yeah uh, ugh, what a what a gross disgusting woman she was i uh bad uh, family i feel i feel really bad for um for Frankie. Frankie. Wait. Frankie. Wasn't that the name of his his colleague as well? That was Freddie. Freddie. Fred, that's right. I was... That's what I thought. I was just trying to remember. But yeah. It's, it's too bad the dad died because Frankie was left with those two maniacs. Yeah. And so, uh, Jerome realizes that Computer 3 is the correct one because he sees the um the uh icon for the the debbie's blue umbrella and so he starts looking through that while bill just kind of waits but then um earlier because when they were trying to figure out like what he might be targeting with the whole weekend thing uh jerome was like what if it's the concert tonight and bill's like not likely it's thursday it's not the weekend 
and I don't think he's trying to mess with us. I think this is, uh, uh, he, I think he's being honest here. Big mistake. Um, so Jerome is looking through the, compu the third computer, and he just starts freaking out. And they come over to look why. And it's, uh, it's his um, email confirmation for his ticket for the concert tonight. So they realize that's where he's going to be. Meanwhile, at this point in time, uh, Brady has gotten everything together uh, and driven to the Mac, gotten in his wheelchair, hooked everything up. Uh, he's using Thing 2 uh, as the it's going to be the, the switch to detonate the uh, explosives he's got uh, on him and the chair. And he has a picture, his picture of Frankie resting. He has the Thing 2 under his shirt and he has the picture of Frankie resting against him uh, as he just has to push on the picture, which will push the switch that will do the detonation. And he just wheels his wheelchair to the uh, stadium. Uh, I will say also, just, just to bring this up, this is this part of the story, they, they start to... Um, speaking of foregrounding things that were in the background, um, this, this the whole bit about Frankie, hey, they, they've talked about... He, He's talked about like not wanting to think about it or like getting memories of it and then feeling like nauseous or sick about it it's interesting that he chooses to bring the picture of frankie with with him um when he's when he's about to do this this last thing it almost and he also says things like he he murmurs to it like i love you frankie and all these kind of things yeah it's kind of interesting it feels like this sort of like guilt it's still that insofar as he can still experience guilt is kind of also in some weird way a part of this uh, incident as well. Yeah. Um, so he makes it in line. Uh, he realizes uh, that they're letting the handicapped people in first, which gives him a bit of stress. Um, but because, you know, we have to have an exciting and intense field filled climax by the time it's almost his turn to be checked and the security does seem to be checking every so many people with their the bags and he's like if i if they see the explosives i'm gonna have to detonate and i won't get as much of a kill count as i wanted but i'll still get something but uh a little a little before it's his turn like three or four spots ahead of ahead of him uh all of the other crowd are began to let in and they're going crazy in a frenzy because you know it's a bunch of uh young women uh excited for their boy band so they're causing a ruckus that causes the security to basically peel off to deal with that, leaving just one woman who's just basically waving people through. And he has the picture with him as ostensibly a cover. He's like, oh, yeah, I lost him. She asks him, the security woman, oh, what's the, with the picture? He's like, oh, it's my son. He was a big fan. And, uh, well, now hopefully he'll be able to hear their new album. And she's like, oh, that's, you know, super sweet. And she just kind of passes him along. So Brady gets in, and he gets Which seated. She couldn't tell that that was, like, at least a, like, 15 to 20-year-old picture. I don't know. Because he's like 28, you know? Uh, you never know. She was also probably... I mean, she's not in, in the absolute best state of mind. I guess that's a no-win scenario. To be like... If, if, if he was... If, if she did call him on it, and it was an actual real picture, which is like weird, looked weird, you would get in, in a massive amount of trouble. So like, yeah. she was really in a no-win scenario. Yeah. So he's he's let through. He's seated with the rest of the um, uh, the other handicapped people in the handicap section, which turns out is uh, not very far away from where uh, Barbara and her friends and and her mom, Jerome's sister, uh, they're sitting. And they 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 saw him a couple of times in the parking lot, and they see him sitting not too far away from them. And it's kind of weird. She takes, like, ownership over him. She, like, she thinks to herself that he is her uh, wheelchair guy. Uh, kind of a weird uh, a weird thing. But it was, I think, intended to, to make her seem nice and to underscore his evil. Because when they were driving in, she saw him, you know, uh, heading to the, the section with where they were la waving them in. And she was like, oh, oh, mom, we need to, let's go help him, you know, that kind of thing. And yeah, it's supposed to be I, endearing. It's not supposed to be mean-spirited or creepy or anything. It's supposed to be endearing on her part, for sure. 
yeah it just it's just another one of those things that like doesn't quite work in this book but the overwhelming majority of stuff does yeah um so uh yeah he's there um he's seated and the concert starts uh so the the our our our, you know our main gang they're racing to the uh the max to try and stop him uh they're trying to get there as fast as they can uh meanwhile the concert has started and Brady knows because when he went to go check on check out the the Mac in one of the previous days, he saw a lot of their props. So his plan is once they um, bring down all the props and get everybody going, that's when he's going to detonate the bombs. Uh, so they're racing to get there. They get there. They know the concert's already started, and they go around. Uh, they get to the back of the building where like all the roadies are, and they're trying to go in. Uh, they they um, contact uh, a janitor on the the, the gate, to, and he says that they're the police. They need to get in. Uh, the janitor meets them out back, and uh, he gets uh, he gets them to uh, he ostensibly takes Holly and Jerome uh, because Bill realizes that 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 pain that he's been feeling in his shoulder that's been ever present since they were at the house is indeed a heart attack. And he's like, I'm having a heart attack, so you guys are gonna have to go on without me. And the um, uh, the janitor he he figures out that they're not really cops, but they've uh, they've. They didn't tell him he figured out that it's a bomb threat, and they are able to convince him this is indeed a real threat, even though they were not cops. But um, yeah, he uh, he's taking he's taking Jerome, who now has Bill's gun, and Holly, who now has the Happy Slapper, to um, to the auditorium, and uh, through 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 some more deductive reasoning, because uh, they know Brady's inside. And earlier he did he did talk to um, one of the security guys at the Mac. Uh, who is someone he used to work with, and he, he he sent over the photo of Brady saying keep an eye out for him. Oh, he's a pedophile, just in case, you know, just to cover all of his bases. Um, but he knows that um, Romper Stomper, as they called him back in the uh, in the precinct, uh, if Brady got in and Romper Stomper found him, they would have canceled the whole thing. So Brady was able to somehow make it in, and that means it's, it has to be because he's looking different. Uh, so what he figures out, is because uh, there's also hair in the uh, uh, in the sink back at his house, so he figures that he either shaved his head or cut it really short and maybe changed his, its color. So he's going to be disguising himself as something. And with everything going on, he figures out what better way to transport explosives than pretending to be handicapped. So, you know, great detective work by Bill Hodges, Hodges by the way, to, to just kind of figure this out. And it didn't really feel like a leap in logic for him to get there. It just kind of felt like it was, you know, he did the work the mental work to figure it out he got there and it's the best thing he he can come up with uh as to how he would be able to transport all the explosives that he has which i don't know i I thought it made sense personally i thought so too so yeah i didn't feel like it was too big of a leap in logic so yeah um the janitor is trying to lead them to the auditorium and tell them where the uh uh the handicap section is uh eventually he, he they get to an elevator or something and he's like oh, up here take a take the right whatever uh so holly and um and jerome are making their final approach to what will uh to to where they think brady is brady meanwhile he's seen barbara and he recognizes her and he can't quite place it but then he figures it out he figures out who she is and he's just you know he's over the moon uh that he's going to be able to kill her and her mom uh because uh, you know he knows that Jerome, he's he's glad that he failed killing killing Bill because he's he wants Bill to to live uh, with what happened and he he's excited that Jerome's going to be able to to experience similar feelings. Just really fucked up shit, really. Uh, so uh, what he's waiting on it the, the the Ferris wheel prop has come down and he's getting ready to set up the bomb uh, and he's like, as soon as she looks over at me and she sees me, that's when I'm going to do it. Uh, meanwhile, Barbara, uh, she's thinking about her um, her wheelchair guy and hoping he's having as much fun as she is. And she looks over and she sees him, and he's smiling and flipping her off, which is kind of confusing her a little bit. But then she sees uh, a, a woman walking up towards him, and believe it or not, is that my brother too? So holding a revolver. <laughs> yeah, she's like, what? Uh, and so. <laughs> Holly comes up to him. We have a little bit earlier where we get a little bit of her backstory about her, her like, her times in, in 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 the institution and whatnot. And one of them was caused back in high school. She one of her bullies was a jock. Um, what was his name? Like Henry. Uh, 
Was it Henry? I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. Or yeah, Mark. He, it was one of the default names. Yeah, I, I don't know. But she goes up to to Brady, and the first thing she can think of is just calling him that guy's name, and she's like, "Oh my God, it's you!" And then she just whaps him right in the head with the happy slapper. It's just as hard as she can. And you see, like, apparently like, a piece of his skull just kind of dents in. And then she just whaps him again. <laughs> like, even harder. And it makes the, the it makes his, his skull cave in even deeper. And he's just, like, he got kind of curls up. He's all, like, shaking. And, like, his body's convul convul convulsing. Um, and so uh, Jerome grabs his arms. Uh, and Holly lifts up his shirt and finds Thing 2. And she's not entirely sure what to do with it. But uh, she checks the back of it and she sees there's batteries in it. And she's not sure whether or not to pull the batteries out. But um, uh, Jerome loses control of Brady and Brady's arm flails and hits her as she's like touching the battery. So she rips the battery out, which turns off Thing 2. Uh, which, again, I feel like if he, if someone is rigged to explode, ripping ripping out battery cables is like a bad a bad thing. <laughs> well, I you know, the thing is... is it's just set to go once the the device is activated. So when you turn off the device, the, the device can't be activated anymore. Therefore, no explosion. He, if he but was, aren't there aren't there things? I don't know. It's maybe, maybe, but it just I've I've seen too many times when there's like a there's like a switch that that's that's what it's for. Is like if and if it loses power, that it, it goes anyway. Yeah. Well, he maybe, didn't. Maybe the, he didn't plan maybe for that. Maybe that's just too many. Well, that's true. He's he's not the not the most not the best plotter we've seen. Yeah, I mean, what what we've seen throughout his character is that when he does the, these these are ostensibly crimes of passion, and he doesn't do too much planning uh, in the way of it. It's just he's gotten very lucky, is what it is. So, yeah, uh, I don't he, I don't see why he would have ever thought that he would need to have some sort of like kill switch thing. To where if any if it was tampered with, um, it would have still gone off, because I mean he doesn't. I, I guess I guess you're right. It's just it's just one of those. Maybe I've just seen too many of these plots in in books and films and TV shows and all that stuff, and I'm like, oh well, what about that 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 wrinkle? Yeah. Well, I think the thing is, is he didn't think he'd be caught off guard because he was constantly trying to be aware of his surroundings, but his his fixation on Barbara is what led him to be caught off guard by Holly, especially with her coming up and being like, uh, John McGeneric name. Is that you? So it was, it was him putting his guard down. Finally, what he, at what he thought was the final moment is what really, I think led to that happening, but she ostensibly disarmed it. She unplugs the, the wire from thing two, And, uh, yeah. Uh, that's it. The, that that's basically it. That's the 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 um the crisis has been averted. Now it's you know it's about taking care of it. But um we don't we don't get the we don't get the the nuance of the and this is what they did next. Meanwhile, uh, Bill at this point in time has um collapsed and, uh, due to the heart attack while he's waiting to hear the explosion, uh, and he loses consciousness. And then the next thing we know, he's waking up in the hospital. Uh, Pete's there, uh, and he's just, he asks about Brady, and he says, "Oh, he's a couple rooms over." He's like, "Oh, am I in am I in uh, in federal hospital?" He's like, "No, you're in the local hospital." Um, but yeah, Brady is in a coma. Uh, Holly and Jerome are. Uh, I think they're being. I think they're at the police station at that point in time. Maybe I don't remember exactly, but. Uh, yeah, they were being questioned for more details. Yeah, um, yeah. Pete uh, talks to talks to him. Basically, it's like you know, this is this is going well far beyond, uh, you know, the retired cops trying to uh, get a little piece of the action to to relive their glory days. It's like this goes way beyond that. Like, what were you thinking? Um, yeah, Bill. He he just kind of he, he doesn't regret anything. He's just like, yeah, you know. I did what I needed to be done, but he ends up, you know, just kind of passing out again. So then we, we have our first of two epilogues, the proclamation, which is just a letter from the mayor saying, Holly and Jerome saved the city selflessly. 
uh, they got they got a medal and they have um, free access to city services for the next ten years. So, woo! Um, if you ask me, that's a kind of lame reward. Hey, you can ride buses for free for ten years. If we had a real functioning society, that would that, that would, I'm sure. Well, I'll, I'll put it this way. I think I think there was there there's that was that was kind of intentional that it was kind of like um, supposed to come off as like oh wow they saved the day and yeah you know, look it's it's basically just a big here effort. here's a coupon so, book to Arby's thanks kids <laughs> exactly that I think that was this book is written with a certain wry sense of humor a dark sense of humor um, and I think that's part of it yeah. And so then we get our final epilogue, uh, as I'm calling it, Blue Mercedes. And it's uh, Holly and Jerome. They're heading to a picnic spot. Uh, she has since painted the gray Mercedes blue. Uh, and they're there meeting with Bill, who now has a pacemaker. Um, and this is kind of our... Th these are where the characters are at now. This is our, our, like I said, our epilogue. Um, all the charges were dropped for Bill. Don't about me. <laughs> yeah, basically. This is our, our breakfast club moment. Um, all the charges were dropped for Bill, uh, but, uh, he's gonna be, he's not gonna be able to, um, do anything somewhat, he can't, he can't be a, he can't get a PI license, he can't join, uh, the, uh, the security force at Sugar Heights, even though they want him to join, because something to do with, like, uh, you can't be bonded. He can't be, yeah. Uh, so he can't do that, um, but he, he did get an offer for, um, it's like a, it's like a loan agency, <laughs> Tracking down people. Bail bondsman, just skip tracer for a bail bondsman. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which I don't. He does. I don't think he says whether or not he's going to do it. But yeah, I think he says he probably won't, uh, or he might. I don't remember. But Holly says that she can help him. Uh, Holly. Uh, so it turns out Janie did have a will. Um, also, uh, I I just want to correct something real quick. Uh, in the previous one, when we were talking about um, uh, Charlotte and Henry. Uh, his name's Henry, by the way. I was I, I thought they were Holly's parents. Um, it was Holly's mother and Holly's uncle. Both of them were Janie's aunt and uncle, and and um, her mom's siblings. So minor correction on my part: they weren't husband and wife; they were brother and sister. Not that it really matters because they're not really. I mean, Henry is pretty pretty disposable. Charlotte is just that that you know crazy bitch relative that is um um, um she just wants money. But uh, turns out Janie did have a will that gave most of her estate to uh, Henry and Charlotte, but also a, a nice half mill to uh, to Holly uh, that was being held by a um, uh, an executor, I guess, and, until she could prove that she uh, was able to use it. Which, uh, with the help of Bill, uh, she's able to get that money. Uh, she uh, uh, Charlotte also gets a place that Holly. Uh, coerces her into letting her live out alone because you know she's like 44, 45. You know she can, she could probably handle herself on her own, honestly. And hey, she's taking Especially her Lexapro with her newfound confidence in her taking her medicine. Yeah, she's she's taking her Lexapro, Bill. Um. Yeah, she says it like eleven times. This yeah. Section. So she's doing good. Jerome's doing good. He's still probably going to school still. You know, he's only 17. And yeah, the the characters share, like, you know, one final moment with each other. Um, and that that's that's the end of their story. Uh, then the book ends. Uh, it's like a year or so later. Um, it's like it's like late 2011. Um, and th there's a weird thing that happens here, and we'll, I'll, I'll talk about it here in a second. But basically, it's uh, a nurse comes from uh, to talk to the doctor about how Brady has woken up. And uh, the only thing he said to her was that uh, he has a headache and he's asking where his mom is. And then after after that last line, uh, it says like September 2013 after that. And I'm really confused as to what that 2013 date is doing there. Because it explicitly states that at the start of this section that it's 2011. It's been like a year and a half since the, uh, the Mac uh, auditorium thing. He's been in a coma for a year and a half, so it has to be late 2011. And like I said, it says that it's late 2011 at the start of this section, but then 
after the final words, which is Brady saying that he has a headache and he's asking for his mom, it just says like September 2013 and then the book ends. I was so confused that was very, by that. That was very odd. I don't know. Maybe it was like that was the date stamp for when Stephen King finished the manuscript or something. I, I don't know because the book came out in 2014. So it but would make sense. Why would he leave that, you know? I, I don't know. But I, I don't know why that, 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 that date stamp was there. But that's the end of the book, ostensibly. Well, yeah, that, that kind of ends it. And it kind of ends on a very odd note. Actually, you know what? Never mind. I'm, I'm can changing my opinion. Stephen King, worst endings of all time. I hate him now. Yeah, well, I mean, you know, I, I, think, I think what this ending shows is that Brady is probably... Um, well, one, he, he's probably mentally regressed uh, substantially to either that of a, a young adult or a young child, depending. We don't know. Because, um, you know, he doesn't remember that his mom's dead. And he says something so as juvenile as, I have a headache. Where's mommy? Um, he's awake. He's got some sort of, of, of cognitive decline or, like, something. But, I mean, you know, like I said, this still feels like a pretty self-contained story. I don't think anybody should reasonably take that as sequel bait maybe brady will come back in the second or third book I, I i don't know but i don't think that alone is supposed to be sequel bait i think it's just supposed to be and this is what happened to brady he woke up and we see his his mental state has deteriorated from the severe head trauma that holly delivered unto him I think that's really all that that is supposed to show it's not like he's going to be released into the world again i mean he's he's a he's a mass murderer uh he's a domestic terrorist he tried to blow up four thousand people a year and a half ago they're not just gonna be like well you're kind of stupid now so have fun in the real world kiddo like he's he's gonna be best case scenario best case scenario like in terms of like for him um committed for the rest of his life uh or in prison for the rest of his life so i don't really think that 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 is supposed to be sequel bait it's just a and then Brady woke up, and he's stupid now. Well, my my joke aside, I don't I don't know if I don't I, I agree with you. I don't think it's sequel bait, but you know, complaining about his headache again could be a sort of the dark humor because he got you know hit in the head. But also, it references earlier aspects of him where he he talks about him having recurrent migraines, and that's part of what led to. Oh, Some yes. Some of the things with his mom. The, the sexual abuse from his mother was to help ease his headaches. Yep, you're right. Yeah. Okay, yeah, that's that's true, too. Asking for mommy so she could give him a tug-off to get his headache on. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, that, I think that's probably part of it. I don't think he's going to make a reappearance. Like, I could be wrong. But I think it's also to kind of be like, oh, and by the way, Holly did not kill him. You know, yeah, maybe something like like that. You know. Well, I mean, we 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 knew that she didn't necessarily kill him, but we we what we didn't know is whether or not she made him a vegetable. But I don't yeah. think anybody in their right mind would say that Holly did anything wrong. No, but you know, there's a lot of contortions and and like like the uh, the famous um, in the Yakuza video game series, Kiryu didn't kill anybody kind of thing. Yeah. Batman doesn't ever kill anybody. You know, that kind of thing. Kiryu did not kill them. The explosion caused from him shooting their vehicle killed them. They, yes. sh they should have been driving non-explodable vehicles. Like, duh. <laughs> or it's like, it's, yeah. like the, it's like the scene from Collateral where um, after, when, when Jamie Foxx is introduced to um, Tom Cruise being a serial killer, a, a hitman, and, he, uh, and like, you know, the body falls on the top of his, of his uh, taxi cab... Uh, and he's like, you killed him. He's like, I didn't kill him. The bullets in the fall killed him. <laughs> Which, oh, what a cold-blooded line. Oh, I love that movie. Everybody should go watch Collateral if you haven't. And, uh, and you should also, you should probably watch, you should probably watch Heat while you're at it. Another great Michael Mann movie. I, I heartily concur. But yeah, um, Daniel, final thoughts on, uh, on Mr. Mercedes by Stephen King good book really good book um definitely recommend to anybody who's um 
if anybody, if we have any listeners that are like, oh yeah, I, I like the early King, but I just haven't really kept up with him. I would recommend it for those people. Um, I would recommend it for people who were like, you know, I'm kind of curious about Stephen King, but I, horror is not really my thing. Yeah, it definitely does feel like it could be a good starter book for someone trying to get into Stephen King, despite it being released 40 years after his debut novel. It, it does feel like it could be a great starter book, given that it, it is, it's not as grotesque or or weird as he can be it does still have those grotesque and weird elements but they're very constrained compared to some of his more egregious examples um Hmm. and it's 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 a very easy read and it's a lot given that it's a it's a mystery thriller it might be a lot more approachable than something like horror for some people yeah um but on the whole, you know, I, I've, I've mentioned my qualms with it. I'm not going to rehash all that. I, I think it's a good book. I think it's it's a lot of fun. It's a great summer read. We still got at least, depending on where you live, at least one more month of summer. Um, for some of us, it's more like three. But, you know, it's it's a good, it's, it's a good you know, kind of like casual read. Um, highly recommend it. Yeah, take it, to, take it with you to the beach. Kick back. To the beach, to the pool. To the window, to the wall. <laughs> to, the, to the Mercedes crushing my balls. <laughs> I was wondering where that was going to go. <laughs> um, ah, thank skeet, you, skeet, goes the tires. Ah, skeet, <laughs> skeet, to my head. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> yeah, th- this is, uh, this is uh, Little John and the Augie Boy. <laughs> That's that's such that's gonna be such a data joke. Do do people still make get low jokes in twenty twenty four? I don't know. Probably no, but you know. How very two thousand three uh, of me. Well, I mean, I, I I appreciated it at least. Yeah. I, but uh, you know, thank you everybody for for listening. Um, this has been another episode of the Sad Boys Book Club. Once again, I'm Daniel. I'm Dusty. And we will see you next time. Yep, take care.